Welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining our special program commemorating Ayurveda Day. And this has been a collaborative effort of the American Association of Ayurvedic Professionals, ARP, Global Council for Ayurveda Research, GCAR, National Credentialing and Certification Board for Ayurveda Medicine, NCCBAM, and it's supported by Ayurveda Anusandhan Abhiyan Foundation of India. I am Dr. Renee Mera, founding member of NCCBM and board member of ARP, and I will be the moderator for the first part of the program, and this will be followed by a panel discussion moderated by Vedya Patibha Shah. We will begin with Dhanvantri prayer. It's a prayer to Lord Dhanvantri, asking for healing us and healing the world. <clears throat> Namami Dhanvantri Madhi Devam Sura Surera Vandit Padupatmam Loke Jararuk Pemrithu Nasham Dhatari Mesham Vididhoshadina Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Thank you all for letting us be a part of your weekend. This year's theme for Ayurveda Day is very relevant, Ayurveda for Global Healthcare. And the strength of Ayurveda is holistic wellness and prevention. And when we integrate Ayurveda, in our mainstream healthcare system, we're not only getting improved healthcare outcomes, we're even addressing health equity and inclusion. And most importantly, we are in tune with ourselves and in tune with nature. And when we get that balance, we get that groundedness and the connectedness, then we are truly happy and healthy in all levels, spiritual, mental, emotional, psychological, and physical. So before we start the program, I'm going to ask Vedya Sujatha Reddy to make some housekeeping announcements. Vedya Sujatha Reddy is the founding member of ARP, and she is on the board of NCCPM, and she's the president of the Colorado Ayurveda Association. Thank you, Renee. <clears throat> uh, some housekeeping here. Uh, first of all, I would like every one of you to mute your microphones. It just helps keep background noise to a minimum. Um, and uh, wait until the presenter allows you to ask any questions. Uh, once the Q&A session starts, you, uh, all of you type your questions on the chat when it's open. Uh, be mindful of the background noise when your microphone is not muted, avoid activities that could create additional noise, such as shuffling papers, uh, clearing your throats, um, kids, whatever that may be. Um, your camera should be positioned properly. If you choose a web camera, be sure it is in a stable position and focused at eye level. And uh, no eating or drinking if your camera is on and limit distractions. Uh, you can make it easier to focus on the meeting by turning off notifications closing or minimizing running apps and muting your smartphone. Avoid multitasking. You will retain the discussion better if you refrain from replying to emails or text messages during the meeting. Be respectful of the moderator during the entire duration of the panel discussions. Uh, be respectful of other panelists during discussion focused on the theme topic of the session. Ensure your power connections for your device you will join with and do not drive while you're on the webinar. Join from a quiet place like you are in a meeting in person with another or your team. Thank you. Hope we all will follow these. Thank, Thank you, you very Back much. You. Thank you very much, Vedya Sujata Reddy. And you know, we get so passionate about uh, our Veda that we forget about the time allocated to us. So we have a timekeeper here today, Vedya Hina Bhatt. She's the Executive Director of Parmok Ayurveda Center in Atlanta, Georgia and the founding member of NCC Dam. Thank you, Vedya Hina Bhatt. I'm sure all of you are gonna enjoy today's program. And 
get very charged and rewired and hopefully pivot to our faith and other traditional healthcare modalities for our daily regimen, which are safe, effective, and holistic. Now, let me introduce to you our organizational heads of today's program. Uh, you'll be able to see the URLs of these organizations and the mission statements in the chat box. Vedya Pratibha Shah, she's from Massachusetts. She has a bachelor's and master's in Ayurvedic medicine and master's in public health from Boston University. She's the founder president of the Council for Ayurveda Research and Holistic Health Alliance in the United States and is the director of the Ayurveda Anusandhan Abhiyan Foundation of India. Over to you, Vedya Pratibha Shah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Reni. Uh, as chair of today's event, I would also like to extend my very warm welcome to all dignitaries, all attendees, as well as our partner collaborating organizations. Our primary goal from today's event is to raise awareness about Ayurveda globally among lay people as well as health professionals. In the limited time we have, also added a succinct panel discussion, which hopefully all of you will find thought-provoking. Now, a few lines about the Global Council for Ayurveda Research, uh, which I'm representing today. GCAR, which was previously known as Council for Ayurveda Research, is a pioneering effort. Uh, one second, sorry, I have to admit one of our speakers. Uh, 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 it's a pioneering effort to promote and establish Ayurveda as an evidence-based science globally. One of our core goals is to create a platform for the exchange, interaction, and integration of information, competencies, expertise, and resources between apex academic institutions, uh, research practitioners, and students in the U.S. as well as in other countries to facilitate research in Ayurveda of the highest global standards. Our mission is to encourage, educate and facilitate basic clinical and interdisciplinary research in Ayurveda. Our vision is to promote and establish Ayurveda as an evidence-based health science globally. Our long-term goal is to become the nodal agency for Indo-US collaborations and initiatives for research in Ayurveda with the ultimate aim of establishing Ayurveda globally as a credible health science. Headquartered in USA, CAR is, a, is, an ex, is expanding its vision to other countries. As of 2019, we have a sister chapter in India by the name of Ayurveda Anusandhan Abhiyan Foundation. CAR team invites volunteers and collaborators alike locally as well as globally to join us in this mammoth much needed undertaking so please email us and all the coordinates are in the chat box thank you so much thank you very much Feder Pratibha Shah I would like to acknowledge the presence of our distinguished speakers Congressman Raja Krishnamurti is taking time off from his election run thank you very much Congressman Raja Krishnamurti I'll be with you very soon and hear your message uh, Council Vipul Dev, the Council for Press Information and Culture, Councilor General of India in New York. Dr. Tanuja Nesri is the Director of the All India Institute of Ayurveda. Thank you all for joining us. And of course, we, uh, and Mr. Bobby Kumar Kaloti, International Chairman Friends for Good Health. Thank you all. And we're continuing to get our guest speakers in Dr. Ravi Kohli, Dr. Geeta Krishnan, Dr. Shivendu Sen. Now, over to our next organizational head. Dr. Vivek Shanbag, he's the president of the American Association of Ayurvedic Professionals, uh, Dr. Shanbag has a master's in Ayurvedic medicine and is a California licensed naturopathic doctor with over 35 years of clinical experience. He's a professor, author, and recipient of Excellence Award in Ayurvedic Teaching and Clinical Practice from the International Academy of Ayurveda. Dr. Shanbag. Thank you, Renee. Namaste to all the dignitaries from the board of directors and also the board of advisors of American Association of Ayurvedic Professionals. Leading Ayurvedic professionals 
in the US and influencing Ayurveda advisors internationally have been working with American Association of Ayurvedic Professionals to unite, educate and empower Ayurvedic professionals to propagate authentic Ayurveda for the healthcare of community. We are also collaborating with more than 35 statewide organizations, international organizations and research institutions. American Association of Ayurvedic Professionals has been conducting educational events through webinars, through conferences, by supporting conferences offered by other organizations. Our guiding principle is Sa Vidya Ya Vimuktaye. Knowledge is that which liberates us. So we want to enhance the knowledge of Ayurveda practitioners. We want to enhance the knowledge of Ayurveda consumers and Ayurveda regulators so that the public is able to make informed choices about what level of Ayurvedic healthcare they would like to use for their wellness. We would want to increase the knowledge of the regulators to understand what levels of Ayurvedic clinical and practical training do various Ayurvedic practitioners get and how they can help the public in making the right choices. So do check out the website of our association www.aaapusa.com And thank you everyone for joining this Ayurveda Day and for making this event a success. Namaste. Thank you very much, Dr. Vivek Shanbab. Over now to Dr. Samesh Kashik. He's the president of the NCCPM, which stands for National Credentialing and Certification Board for Ayurvedic Medicine. Dr. Kashik has a bachelor's in Ayurvedic Medicine and master's in public health and public administration from the University of Alabama, Birmingham. He's also a naturopathic doctor and has almost 40 years of clinical and teaching experience in Ayurveda. Dr. Kashik. Thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, Dr. Renee, thanks and uh, welcome all the dignitaries, all the speakers, guests, uh, panelists. Uh, so, AAP is making sure that it brings all the people together. GCAR makes sure that we do a lot of research. And NCCBM makes sure that we provide qualified practitioners to our community. Ultimate goal for all of us is to make sure that we are taking care of safety and well-being for the consumers. So NCCBAM provides certification and credentialing to BAMS graduates and other who are going to graduate from US Ayurvedic schools with doctorate degree, making sure they are qualified and providing, making sure that we provide the best qualified practitioners to our community. So natural, our, our ultimate goal is to provide safety, making sure that the public which is going to see and be being treated with our qualified practitioners get the best qualified practitioners. And in that case, we need to make sure that the quality of education, quality of training, clinical and the, then, then the classroom training is the ultimate. And with that goal, we need all everybody's support and again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sumesh Kashik. Now let's move on to our very distinguished array of uh, speakers. First, let's go to the message from Vedir Rajesh Kotecha. He's the Secretary, Ministry of Ayush, Government of India, and Ayush AYUSH is promoting and preserving the traditional healthcare systems, including Ayurveda, yoga, Yunani, Siddha, homeopathy, naturopathy, and Tibetan medicine. 
Dr. Rajesh Potesh has many, many publications to his credit. He has received many awards, including the Padma Shri in 2015 by the President of India. He's been an active member of various research councils and advisory boards and committees of many institutions and organizations in the field of Ayurvedic education and research. Let's hear his message. I would be delighted to address all of you this one Ayurveda celebration being organized by American Association of Ayurveda Professionals, Google Council for Ayurveda Research, National Credit Training and Certification Board of Ayurveda in support of Ayurvedic Ayurveda Anusandhan Vidyan Foundation of India. On behalf of the Institute of Ayurveda Government of India, I extend my sincere appreciation and compliments to the organizers for their dedication and commitment in celebrating this event in India. I am happy to learn that considering the increasing global acceptance and exponential growth of Ayurveda, the theme for the event is chosen to be Ayurveda for Global Healthcare. At present, we are witnessing a highly receptive environment where the importance of Ayurveda is widely recognized and globally acclaimed for its holistic health care approach. The Ministry of Pius has taken many initiatives with an aim to serve the country and the world, ensuring holistic well-being and thereby improving the quality of life of people to Ayurveda. Presently, Ayurveda products are being exported to more than 100 countries and Ayurved is recognized as a system of traditional medicine in more than 30 countries around the world and has received a magnetic appeal globally. As the world gravitates towards holistic well-being, all eyes are turned towards India, promoting Ayurved through Heal in India and Heal by India initiatives will surely make India as a leading global healthcare destination. We have to move beyond the borders of India and become an acceptable healthcare system across countries so that large number of people from all continents visit India to get holistic healthcare. I wish the event a great success and hope for fruitful deliberations during this event. Thank you. Namaste. Jai Hind. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajesh Kotesha, Secretary, Ministry of Ayush, Government of India, uh, for your very encouraging message. And you're right, all eyes are on India, especially with its Ayurveda and other traditional medicine systems that look at health from a holistic lens. Our next speaker is Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy. He represents the 8th Congressional District in Illinois. Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy served on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis, the Committee on Oversight and Reform, and as Chairman of its Subcommittee on Economic and Consumer Policy, Vice Chair of the LGBTQ Equality Caucus, Co-Chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus Immigration Task Force, and as an Assistant Whip for the Democratic Caucus. Congressman Raja Krishnamurti, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you, Renee. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Well, it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you to everybody for joining. And, um, you know, happy uh, Ayurveda Day. You know, I think Ayurvedic medicine uh, is um, uh, something that a lot of people have thought about, especially during the pandemic, and um, how, you know, the combination of body, spirit, and mind are so essential for curing what ails us. And I think that um, now there's a growing recognition around the world that these traditional forms of medicine have a place uh, in the general uh, healthcare system that we utilize to treat people. In fact, just recently, uh, the uh, World Health Organization combined with the Ayush Ministry, who is ably represented by the 
previous speaker, entered into an agreement whereby India would host the WHO's Global Center for Traditional Medicine. And the head of the WHO said the following. He said, for many millions of people around the world, traditional medicine is the first port of call to treat many diseases. Ensuring all people have access to safe and effective treatment is an essential part of WHO's mission. And this new center will help to harness the power of science to strengthen the evidence base for traditional medicine. So I'm, I'm uh, cognizant that uh, there are people in this world that uh, don't know uh, the full evidentiary base for Ayurvedic medicine, but there's a growing recognition that we need to establish that evidentiary base and combined with uh, modern medicine, uh, make sure that all treatments that work are available to everybody. And so I just wanna say thank you to all of you for helping in that mission. Um, the fact that 80% of people in India and in many other parts of the world uh, practice uh, this traditional form of medicine uh, is a sign that we need to take it increasingly more seriously and make sure that we apply whatever lessons we can learn uh, to help as many people get better fast. So thank you so much uh, for allowing me to say a couple words and uh, God bless all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Congressman Krishnamurti, for taking time out. And you rightly said we have actually from WHO, Dr. Krita Krishnan is one of our speakers today. He's going to tell us all about how we're moving forward with traditional medicine, especially with John Nagar. We have the Global Center for Traditional Medicine that was inaugurated just a few months ago. So thank you very much for joining us. Our next speaker is Consul Vipul Day. He's a consul for Press Information and Culture. Consul General of India in New York. Consul Vipul Dave is a career diplomat from the Indian Foreign Service, and currently he is the Consul for Press Information and Culture in New York. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mehra. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to represent the Consul General of India uh, for this uh, wonderful meeting. And a very, very happy uh, Dhanvantri day to everyone. A very happy Diwali also to everyone. And just a short disclaimer that I am recovering from COVID, so I won't be able to speak much. But whatever little I can speak, I will utilize that time to, you know, underscore a couple of things about uh, the science of Ayurveda. As uh, most of us would know, I mean, it's a meeting of experts, so they would know a lot more than I do, that Ayurveda is the science of life and uh, it's a holistic uh, way of medicine so uh, these days we have grown accustomed to you know uh, specializations and micro specializations so uh, in that background when you talk about a system of medicine which a uh, is holistic it talks about not just your entire body but your body mind and spirit as the congressman just uh, uh, just uh, said apart from that it puts the human being at the center of this entire conversation about healthcare rather than uh, you know these days there are a lot of other motivations whether it is you know you call it profit or so many other things which drive the healthcare research as well as the treatment and the way entire uh, discourse is conducted but ayurveda brings a radical departure uh, in our entire thinking how we see uh, human healthcare so that is another point that i would like to underscore and <coughs> i'm sorry for the past few years the government of India has done uh, immense work. They have given a lot of momentum and energy to uh, research in Ayurveda. And uh, as speakers uh, before me mentioned, this uh, center in, in Jamnagar uh, with the help of WHO. So this is a great milestone in bringing uh, Ayurveda closer to the modern ways of conducting research and doing medicine. And uh, another initiative of the government is the mission life that the prime minister will launch uh, pretty soon. So that also has traditional medicine methods at the center of this entire conversation about well-being. And uh, especially over the last few years, uh, since we have been, the entire world has been grappling with COVID. So uh, I feel that the centrality of uh, holistic healthcare and putting the human being at the center 
uh, the entire world has become more and more aware of these these very very important things and since ayurveda talks about these things has been talking about these things for centuries and millennia so it is uh, a great opportunity for all the experts in this field to bring out those aspects of ayurveda in front of the world and uh, we can show the world that there are other ways of thinking other ways of seeing the world other ways of approaching the fundamental question of healthcare so with these words uh, i would thank again um, the organizers and all the speakers and panelists and experts thank you so much thank you very much council vipul dev and i hope you recover soon uh, thank you for joining us it's been tough for you i know but thank you and you rightly said you know when we heal we're healing on all levels and is we're looking at a person as an organic whole not just little components and that's what ayurveda and that's what traditional medicine is all about so thank you over on to our next speaker dr tanuja nasri thank you for joining us from india dr nasri is the director of the all india institute of ayurveda she's the chair for the health sector sub skill council for ayush and member of the governing council of the institute of medical sciences of Benares Hindu University. She serves on the academic board of several universities, including Institute of Training and Research in Ayurveda in Jamnagar and National Academic and Research Bodies. Dr. Nasri is the CEO of the National Medicinal Plant Board of India in Delhi, which is under the Ministry of Ayush for the promotion of medicinal plants in India and overseas. Dr. Tanisha Nasri. Thank you. Namaste. Am I audible, Dr. Rini? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah. So thank you for introducing me in a very nice words. Uh, at the outset, I would like to congratulate and both thank the organizers, AAP, NCC BAM, and GCR, uh, Dr. and my friends, Dr. Rini, uh, Dr. Pratibha Sham, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sham Shanbak, and now I could hear, uh, uh, hear uh, Somesh Kaushik as well, and all the esteemed members of the organizing committee at the outset from All India Institute of Ayurveda and uh, Ministry of Ayush Secretary Vaidya Rajesh Koteja, to whom you heard the, his message also, and all the members of the esteemed panelists uh, who have joined. Today, I, on behalf of All India Institute of Ayurveda, uh, we extend our heartiest greetings on Diwali, on Ayurveda Day, and congratulations for organizing. Uh, all the mem all the esteemed organizers, they have come on the one platform and organizing Ayurveda Day, not for the East, but all the uh, esteemed members from the West. So this is like a, you know, we are meeting East and West through integration and complimenting each other so uh, please accept our greetings and compliments and i also wish to greet ravi kohli ji shivam soem vipul dev and geeta krishnan ji and bobby and all the esteemed panelists it's a great honor to share uh, this platform with the guest uh, great speakers and the panelists as well uh, this year as ayurveda day is being celebrated on dhanvantari day since 2016 but this year is a very special year. That's what I, what what we did, and what Ministry of Ayush appeal is that I would like to share with each and every one. Um, you may be aware that this year Ayurveda Day is being celebrated as uh, Ayurveda everyone by everyone, Ayurveda everywhere, and Ayurveda at every household. That is, Har Din Har Ghar Ayurveda. As we are celebrating Ajadika Amrut Mohotsav, 75 years of independence, uh, like we celebrated with Tiranga, everyone celebrated uh, 15th August. The similar way, looking at Ajadika Amrut Kal, that is India at 2047, uh, if we really want to lead the world as a healthcare and take care of each and every human being across the globe as a global family and Ayurveda and yoga being the greatest gift to the humanity, a soft far up India to everyone. So it was envisioned by Honorable Prime Minister like yoga reached 
to 200 countries like international yoga day following the yoga day this year ayurveda day is being celebrated not only by ministry of ayush but it is as a whole government approach all 26 ministries join together to celebrate har din har ghar ayurved and focusing on india at 2047 if we really want to build this economy and develop the nation and the economy and the healthy nation i think uh, from today itself each and every household everyone should be healthy and happy and ayurved is the way which makes everyone healthy and happy and that's why healthy to become the healthy nation each one should inculcate the habits healthy habits and ayurveda way of living healthy and happy life that's the message uh, we want to reach to each and every household and that's why har din har ghar ayurved ayurved by everyone and ayurved by everywhere uh, this message has been promoted communicated and the awareness is being promoted and just celebrating on the one day the habit would not be uh, inculcated so the scientific research says that if anything is to make the habit then continuous 45 days we have to practice consistently that's why in india what we did is for 6 weeks with different themes like ayurved for holistic well being then for geriatric for millennials for the youth mental health uh, and sharing the experience like like what we are doing now from east and west that has been celebrated with the great zeal and not all ayush institutions and the vaidyas and the physicians they celebrated but the education institutions from school going children to the institutions to it broadcasting for ministry of culture and they celebrated in their own way with the three things jan bhagidari jan sandesh and jan andolan what does it mean it is the participation creating awareness and creating a mission celebrating this mission this following the ayurved and uh, making the ayurved as a way of living healthy and happy life this message creating the awareness is the center of this thing and this theme and how do we do it we do follow good diet good lifestyle but if we really make this as a medicine to be followed by every home care i think people will understand the importance of a good sound sleep and the diet rejuvenation the ayurveda way of various local in systemic and holistic and complementary way more than that i would like to say here i'll take only renal not take much time but i would like to say here that ayurveda is a journey from illness to wellness to happiness so if people understand it is not only wellness but it adds the happiness but where is the evidence for this so the center of this theme is the scientificity of ayurveda so even we follow practice and create awareness for each and everything why this sleep is important why this circadian rhythm is important how the harmony is being created and what is the diet and the nutritional value really ayurveda way how really so for each and everything even for drinking warm water what is the science behind it so this science we just go to each and every one and explain the scientific aspects of the ayurveda so earlier even though we have the experiential basis we say that from practice based evidence now we are moving from evidence based practices so even during covid time we whatever we did we had the evidences for 80000 police people what we did prevention kit now that has been published into frontiers of public health with the public health research each and every 600 patients where there was no mortality the research the publication is in the center place so each and everything is being translated into the language which entire world scientists physicians understand and that's the way how everyone would develop the confidence in following simple measures as a home care measure even for the cardha also we have the evidence and this ayurveda day i am very happy because all india institute of ayurveda which is a tertiary care hospital and postgraduate research 
and training institution we were given the responsibility as a nodal institution we have developed ayurveda day dot in i repeat www.ayurvedaday.in as a website and each and every one is sharing their experience like we are celebrating please share your experiences and upload so that gives all together uh, the report of the ayurveda day celebration we have 80 lakhs 8 million people who have already celebrated more than 10000 programs have been done and on one day for 48 hours there was a mission as i support ayurveda and i'm very happy that 22 million people supported in 72 hours i support ayurveda so with these words i appeal and urge everyone please make ayurveda as a part of your daily routine and please communicate to each and every household with the scientificity of ayurveda So thank you very much for organizing this wonderful event. I wish all the best, and I really feel honored and blessed to be a part of this program. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Tanuja Nayeshri. With these mind-boggling statistics, you just gave twenty-six ministries joined over ten thousand programs. Uh, it this is this is what we are saying, and I've said it before as well. When we pivot to our Veda. When we pivot to traditional medicines, we really get positive health outcomes, and we are in tune with ourselves. So, thank you very much for sharing those statistics with us. We're now being joined by Dr. Ravi Kohli. He's the president of the RP uh, Association, which is the Association of American Physicians of Indian Origin. He's a board certified psychiatrist with additional qualifications in addiction, geriatric and forensic psychiatry. He serves as a psychiatric medical director of Southwestern Pennsylvania Human Services. Dr. Ravi Kohli. Good afternoon for those in the East Coast and uh, good morning to the rest of the people in West Coast and uh, probably good evening in India. Uh, thank you for having me here, Dr. Rene. and uh, this is my distinct honor and pleasure uh, to represent AAPI American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin um, we have deep connections with a lot of uh, uh, traditional medicinal, medicinal practitioners and during our global health summit we have had a day for, with ayush team in global health summit in hyderabad a couple of years back so we have deep relationship with uh, traditional medicine practitioners and we respect them and um, I want to uh, thank all the dignitaries who took time to be here and encourage this movement. And our time has come. Our traditional medicine has been there for over thousands of years, and now uh, even the Western sciences have recognized we have to treat the whole person, not the illness. And like the previous speaker said, it's from illness to wellness to happiness is our goal. And as a psychiatrist, my special emphasis is. Uh, providing uh, and, and uh, happiness and uh, blissfulness to our patients um, who suffer from serious mental health problems there is uh, some evidence and there is some hidden evidence that we have to uncover and uh, uh, recover from traditional sciences scientific teachings as you all know you're all experts in ayurveda i'm just a student still and uh, there have been medicines uh, that have based on uh, herbal medicines like uh, Uh, actually the one of the first treatment for schizophrenia came from reserpine sarpagrandha uh, which was the ravulfia um, um, medicine so that was yohambine and all those reserpine was discovered from that and uh, that was proven to be an effective treatment for schizophrenia at that time but other tre- treatments have taken over after that based on those principles similarly recently more studies have been done on uh, other uh, herbal medicines like uh, ashwagandha and b Brahmi and uh, uh, other go to cola and all those things that have shown some evidence that they are effective in treating various uh, psychiatric disorders. So we need to integrate those in a safe way with the traditional allopathic treatments. While allopathic treatments tend to treat acute illnesses and uh, um, provide uh, acute care, the wellness and maintenance of health can be. probably more easily accomplished by uh, traditional medicine practices of 
proper diet, proper nutrition, proper rest, proper relaxation, proper socialization, and all those things. These things are being rediscovered by lifestyle medicine practitioners and integrative medicine practitioners. And API, we have started a new committee called Integrative Medicine Ad Hoc Committee, headed by Dr. Indranila Basu, who is a well-known uh, writer and uh, author of uh, many cardiology textbooks. And uh, he recently published a book on cardiology and Ayurveda and yoga, and that has been reviewed by many people, including uh, uh, forward by uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji. So we are planning to do some more of uh, these kind of activities to integrate uh, traditional medicine of Ayurveda as well as uh, Western medicines. We look forward to having uh, some of you come and present uh, some continuing medical education to our members and we would like to also join your organizational activities and uh, integrate. The integration is important, right? The traditional and uh, uh, Western sciences need to be integrated. So we're looking forward to our collaboration to educate more people on evidence base of Ayurveda and she's there, we need to just uncover and recover it from uh, some kind of obscure texts and uh, uh, other ways it was hidden. And um, Ayurveda tradition has uh, showed that vaccination existed before uh, Western science have discovered that. And that also surgeries have been done in our Ayurvedic tradition that are predated any surgeries by Western medicine. So we have a proud tradition. We need to integrate that and we need to bring it out to general public in a very scientifically acceptable manner. So I think we can, uh, like uh, Dr. Tanu just said, we need to make uh, it's a daily activity and a daily movement and a national movement. And the fact that WHO is starting a center in India is an acknowledgement of our, our contributions over the years and our continuing contributions. Thank you and thank you for giving me this opportunity, Rene, and I'm looking forward to hearing from the rest of the speakers and learning a lot and take it back to my practice as well as my members. Thank you very much, Dr. Ravi Kohli, and I totally uh, am with you on partnerships, collaborations, because that bring in a new approach. And when you're bringing a non-pharmacological approach in your area of expertise, especially mental health, we are accelerating the treatment progress and uh, thank you for joining and hope you can continue to stay with the program today. My pleasure. Over now to Bobby Kumar Kaloti, he's a dear friend of mine. Mr. Kaloti is the International Chairman of Friends for Good Health, a philanthropic organization that sends teams of leading healthcare professionals to provide vital medical services in the world's most affected regions. He's also one of the longest serving directors on the board of directors of Nassau University Medical Center. And Bobby Kumar Kaloti is the chairman of Nassau County Commission on Human Rights in Long Island, New York. Over to you, Bobby G. Thank you so much, uh, Renu, good my, uh, Dr. Renu Mehra. My greeting to you and all your distinguished members who join us. It's a privilege and honor for me to join well established, knowledgeable, a very credible people. Thank you for having me, Renu Mera. Uh, you know, let's go back to the trad tradition part. I take you back all the way back to Lord Rama. When his own brother, Lakshma, came in a situation there was no modern medicine that time. And God, Hanumanji, brought a Sanjeevani booty to cure him. And did religiously. If you look at it, go back to the ancient time. But Dr. Kohli was saying, another distinguished member had spoken. There is a traditional medicine that we use and we all are used to it in India, China, and South Asia, actually in Africa as well. I traveled 85 countries, lived in five, met every head of the state in the world, including a Pope. There's not a one head of the state, I would say that I did not have the <clears throat> honor to meet. But I'm trying to say, living in, traveling around, I am so much proud to say I'm Indian and what you make me feel proud all these distinguished doctors 
had made the world known not only medicine a practice serving the people but when you go back to the tradition uh, dr mera i go back from the small village i come from 10 mile radius no hospitals my mom lived 93 grandma lived over 100 which you know i you and i share that story many of other uh, they never had a modern medicine but they have ayurvedic medicine they have homeopathic medicine the way of eating way of living even when we use the word, word namaste the way we bow to others i think that have a meditation they have a meaning ayurvedic medicine does not become addicted but that's heal built your immune system i am not against modern medicine but if you look at it just a small headache pain killers basic surgeries you get medicine for 7 to 10 days 15 days and the next thing you know our youth are addicted to the same medicine which is overdose and kill i don't know any i'm sure these distinguished people can tell you better than i do i never saw somebody die from ayurvedic medicine or get addicted we must continue bring the awareness we must continue bring this education to the world from we learn religiously we learn just living in the if you look look at it the majority of the world live in the villages and what they do they practice a pretty much ayurvedic homeopathic medicine every day even in a modern world because when you have a headache what do you do is because you didn't eat something properly properly i am not as well educated as this your panel is but i am able to serve in three different medical universities i learned a lot i'm still learning but i applaud every doctor every your panelist please continue this basic education that we had learned at home growing up growing up i'm going to end with the because you have a uh, time uh, restraint so i want to end with one basic it sound like a joke but it's a reality where we come from when you go travel around the world in western culture we are told everybody is a doctor in india some of people are suspicious they did not believe in it so they find a commission from 10 different countries they decided to go to india they go to india get up on the airport one of the person pretended he something happened to him and he lied down even the car drive uh, auto rickshaw car rickshaw you can call everybody who was around they surrounded the person start saying give him the, uh, give him water quickly hold his head lift him up put him in this way give a hot water or give a cold don't give a cold water but those were surprise not a one person who was surrounding didn't suggested something so where do all those suggestion come from while they growing up in house they practice those things every day so to me is what you learn at home don't try to compromise over modern medicine yes modern medicine is very important we not going to uh, judge as a second but there is when there is a surgery i like when dr kohli uh, said and he doing actually great job i applaud you dr kohli the work you doing in rp and continue i uh, i i love you guys you guys do a great job make india and indians proud around not only the united states around the world when you go on your charitable missions dr mera i am not going to take more time again i want to say thank you to you to your panel i think i'm going to learn listen by listening you can learn today and this is after you know dr kohli and other distinguished members spoken i think is the best for me to say 
thank you what you do god bless you your families but i do want to say it's not only ayurveda day today every day is ayurveda day every day actually today is a chat puja as well energy from the sun so i wish everybody happy diwali happy new year happy every day god bless you again dr mera to you and to your organization i applaud you keep the continue this work because needed education what we had from our ancient time and the development we have from ancient time we should not forget we should continue that tradition god bless all of you thank you for having me thank you very much mr babi kumar kalodi for your inspiring words and yes every day should be an arveda day every day absolutely good reminder thank you over on to our next speaker dr geeta krishnan he's a technical officer at the traditional complementary integrative medicine unit of the world health organization in geneva switzerland His current work with WHO entails development of global standards of practice and training, development of standard terminologies and data collection and analytic systems for morbidities managed by traditional medicine. He's also responsible in development of digital tools to support safe and effective self-health care practices in the area of health promotion and is engaged in supporting low and middle income countries to develop national policies and guidelines for the appropriate use of traditional medicine within the national health systems over to you dr geeta krishnan very good evening can you hear me um, yes we can thank you thank you so much um let me first of all uh, congratulate uh, you dr uh, rini and uh, your organization for organizing this uh, this uh, program on uh, on on the international ayurveda day and uh, i would like to wish all of you my my greetings from uh, on on the occasion of the international ayurveda day and a very uh, like um, i am very honored to speak uh, at at the presence of you know such uh, honored guests you have like you know brought together here and i think it is quite important to see that uh, like uh, like the kind of advocacy that you are doing uh, for ayurveda is actually uh, bringing kind of a Uh, kind kind of attention to the to the cause of ayurveda and to the needs of ayurveda and also to the needs of the community you had asked me to talk about uh, the global uh, opportunities or glo- global uh, ayurveda in the in, in in the area of global health from a who perspective as you had uh, you had you had mentioned already in a while while you were you know introducing me what who was doing but i will definitely go through some of the activities with who is doing as far as ayurveda is concerned uh, who is supporting member states to uh, to understand and regulate ayurvedic system by creating a practice and training benchmark document uh, this has been developed uh, with the help of around 36 countries and uh, covering all the continents uh, and then it, it is it's considerably accepted uh and it uh, and and this document is currently being uh, used by many member states to initiate their process of regulating traditional medicine especially new new states which have which do not have yet uh like you know regulation of ayurveda they are very 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 keenly looking at these documents and trying to find out whether they can they can create the framework we are also supporting them for that uh some of the um, like So some of the states which of course i cannot tell the names right now but basically in the geography of uh, of the middle east uh, is, is mostly like you know is finding quite a quite an uptake of these documents so uh, that is quite encouraging for us as well as in africa uh, other than this we are also developing and soon uh, going to publish in the next one month a document for of, of international standard standard terminologies for ayurveda Uh, this is a consensus document which will give uh, the uh, make communication about ayurveda much more easier for for uh, for the ayurvedic practitioners as well as for researchers as well as for modern medicine and research scholars the it, it also it also is supportive for the regulators because one of the main problems that ayurveda faces is the is the lack of appropriate communication tool or what is being communicated sometimes it does not get over to the other side so that is the whole purpose of this document we have 
uh, identified four four thousand old uh, uh, terms from in, from from the from the medical concepts and identified the corresponding terms in Ayurveda and then connected them with the description as well as with a like you know kind of a definition. So it becomes much more convenient. It is not going from an Ayurvedic term to the modern medical term. It is going from a modern concept or or a current concept in the medical sense and going back to the Ayurvedic term. So it is it's quite a it's kind of a thesaurus which which is which has taken us around four years to develop and we should be publishing it this year. Another good work which we have initiated and have gone halfway through is the development of the uh, international classification of diseases uh, into which we are developing the traditional medicine module 2 which includes a unified set of Ayurveda, Yunani and Siddha mobility codes. Uh, to, to just give an explanation of what of course most of you know and I'm sure all of you know but still uh, if there is somebody listening who doesn't know that uh, international classification of diseases is the is the uh, is a tool by which uh, with the governments uh, of all countries actually try to understand what are the kinds of diseases their population is going through or having or are afflicted with on a yearly basis. This has major value in terms of understanding the disease pattern, the quantity and the, and the type of disease in, of, of different kinds in, in, in a population. But at the same time, if it is repeating, then there is always a possibility for the governments to plan for the health needs of their, of their, of their countries. Until now, this data was not available because we didn't have any kind such any kind of such data uh, tool by which we could the governments could identify uh, the, the 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 or count the number of cases in in, in the population for as far as Ayurveda is concerned, and we are providing this in, in, this this particular uh, tool by which this will be available for all over the globe to see what is happening. For example. Uh, in India, only under the government framework, as on today, there are 97 million outpatients who have seen, uh, who has, who have seen an Ayush practitioner uh, in, in this year. You know, starting it is more than 97 million as on today. So, if you look at that, uh, this is a huge amount of data. But we do not know why these people are going exactly to see an Ayush practitioner and what kind of benefit they are getting, etc. You know, like so when this tool comes in, we will know this spectrum more correctly. We will know the repetition of this kind of spectrum, who is going where, what kind of treatment, what disease, what condition of the disease, etc., which will help the governments in India, government in India to decide what they should be spending on. But at the same time, that becomes a data source for other countries to look at and say, okay, you see this many number of patients are have been treated through Ayurveda for this particular condition and which has shown the kind of benefit which is there and you know, and therefore, it is definitely useful for us to try it in their regulatory environment. So this is one of the reasons or one, one of the major reasons why ICD over a period of time will have an impact in the propagation and appropriate regulation of Ayurveda to an uptake of Ayurveda by the health systems. Another major work uh, which we have been doing, uh, which we have initiated is the development of the International Herbal Pharmacopoeia. The international herbal pharmacopoeia, as you know, pharmacopoeias are the basic documents based on which the governments regulate uh, herbal medicine or any of the medicines. You know, so there is there is, there are no there is no such international herbal pharmacopoeia until now, which we are creating, and, and that's also going to be a consensus document. Which when it comes, uh, uh, like the the products which are part of that. Uh, will be will be accepted through a, a, a kind of a UN regulatory process. That means the member states will be accepting it through a through, uh, through the World Health Assembly, and that means you know it's it's actually mandated for all states to accept it. You know, or, or rather, it becomes very easy for for new uh, for for unregulated markets or or unregulated you know, countries which are not regulating herbal medicine to. To take up those herbal medicines which are part of that herbal pharmacopoeia and include it in their system or into their regulatory process. This is actually a huge support for making sure that uh, access to herbal medicine or access to traditional medicine is properly provided and we will have a major part of it covering Ayurvedic medicine. So it is going to be a major document. It's going to be long, but it, it will take around four, four and a half years to complete, but we have initiated that, that work on, um, and it's on our table. 
Another work, which of course you know, is the Global Center for Traditional Medicine, which has been established in the in, in the beginning of the year uh, by, uh, by by the, by the Prime Minister of uh, India, uh, Sri Narendra Modi, and the DG of WHO, Dr. Tedros. So this uh, this happened on 19th of April 2022. The purpose of the Global Center of Traditional Medicine is to support member states and also major WHO officers with enough evidence and uh, sufficient evidence and uh, you know like implementation mechanisms so that they can utilize safe evidence-based efficient uh, traditional medicine into their uh, in, in their health systems you know, and ayurveda is going to play a major role in that and global center for traditional medicine will be a may, going to play a major role you know in the, in the propagation and acceptance of ayurveda from uh, these are what who is doing for ayurveda from the other point of view how WHO looks at uh, Ayurveda as a tool, we think that uh, the, the 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 traditional medicine, especially systems like Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine, which has been long established and well established with a lot of evidence and research, will uh, play a major role in reducing the cost of uh, cost or, or af- increasing the affordability of medication and treatments, and uh, to, to the population. It will also make sure that the health services are available to a larger section of the po- population um, and making sure that nobody is left behind uh, for getting for getting medical services we, it will also make sure that you know uh, we can have appropriately trained health workforce in the in the community and uh, it will also take into account the the extended life period that humans are are are, are coming across nowadays with the recent advancements in uh, in science and you know in the, in the community and the social health structure there are more more and more people living for more and more uh, number of years but it doesn't mean that they are living healthy for more and number of years they are just extending their life now we want to be living during this life period you know so that's what we are trying to do uh, to 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 and, and and traditional medicine can do a lot and especially ayurveda has a lot to do offer in 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 the area of geriatric care and that is something which we are seriously considering of including and we think that it has a major major role to play in it these are all based on the sustainable development goals of un and we think that we will we will be going forward in the next 10 years to towards, towards these four directions and we should be able to use ayurveda and other tr- traditional systems of medicine appropriately in this direction i uh, this is what i have to explain uh, or tell you about what we have been doing and how who is seeing uh, ayurveda as a tool uh, for for extending its own capabilities and strengths uh, to achieve its goals, I think that um, I, I again congratulate you for having organized this meeting and uh, also for inviting me to speak here. Thank you so much, Rene. Thank you very much, Dr. Keita Christian. I know you're traveling from Frankfurt to Geneva today, so thank you for joining us today. And we will look forward to that extensive research document that you're talking about in the near future. And nobody should be left behind in the health sector. So thank you, and uh, and thank you for WHO to moving forward with the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you very much. And over on to our last speaker who could not make it, but he sent a message, and that's Dr. Shivendu Sen. He's the Vice Chair of Research Faculty, Internal Medicine, New Jersey University in Hackensack, Jersey. And he is nationally and internationally recognized physician, author, speaker, and a humanitarian. Let's hear his message, Dr. Shivendu said. As a physician and as a scientist, I've always marveled at the limitless repertoire of medicine. It's tremendous dynamic potential. It's evolutionary nature. What was considered to be alternative medicine would quickly become complementary and then will be called integrative to be called as a mainstream medicine. In essence, medicine is like an encircling embrace where we embrace the unknown, we put the unknown under scientific trials, and then we call it our very own. Ayurvedic medicine is one such embrace, a wonderful opportunity to make it our very own mainstream medicine. The very basic philosophy of Ayurvedic medicine is what the drug does to the body, 
is as important as what the body does to the drug. So in a sense, Ayurvedic medicine is at once both an external as well as an internal journey. Ayurvedic medicine also focuses on plants and herbs. If you look around all the major drugs in the world today, be it aspirin or morphine or digoxin or chemotherapeutic drugs, they all have their beginning from plant and herbs resources, which is what Ayurvedic medicine focuses on. I will ask for more research, more trials, more funding to explore the boundless possibilities of our families. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaved Hussain, and sharing the trajectory of traditional medicine from alternative to complementary to integrative and then embracing it in mainstream medicine. Thank you. And I just want to thank all my speakers today in the first half of the program. Thank you for joining and spending some time with us this weekend. And also want to give a shout out to our media partners, Professor Saluja from Indian Panorama, Kamnesh Mehta from South Asian Times, and Sunil Hali of Divya Bhaskar, Indian Eye, Indian Eye Television, and Radio Zindagi. Thank you all. Now over to Vedya Pratibha Shah, to moderate the panel discussion, a collective of Ayurvedic experts sharing their insights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Remy, and to everyone who has joined in the uh, a little later than when we started. Um, I would like to extend once again a very warm welcome on behalf of all the partner organizations that have come together uh, to put together this event, which is Global Council for Ayurveda Research, American Association of Ayurvedic Professionals, and National Credentialing and Certification Board of Ayurvedic Medicine, NCCPAM, um, for coming together and um, in the spirit of collaboration. We are, we are uh, representing different areas of the Ayurveda fraternity. And we are really happy to come together and you'll be seeing more of this collaborative effort moving forward. So with that, uh, once again, a very warm welcome to everyone and also um, wishing everyone a very happy Ayurveda day. Uh, belated, you know, the May the celebrations continue and uh, also uh, wishing everyone a very happy Diwali. Um, uh, Sarve Santu Sukhi Naha, Sarve Santu Niramaya is the mantra. So with that, we will get started with our uh, wonderful panel discussions. But before that, I would like to extend a heartfelt thanks to Dr. Reni Mehra, who is our events coordinator for today's event, for bringing the amazing galaxy of speakers in the first half of the program. Thank you, Dr. Reni. Thank you. Yes. And now on to the panel. So before we get on to the introduction of our panelists, um, I would like to uh, continue in the spirit of all that our previous speakers have mentioned. Um, we are in a very unique time span for Ayurveda, especially post pandemic, there has been an increased spotlighting on Ayurveda and our capable, very capable Ayush Secretary Vaidya Rajesh Kotechaji has taken the lead in India to not only bring Ayurveda into the mainstream uh, healthcare, but also he has been instrumental, he and the uh, and Prime Minister Modi ji, as um, uh, Raja Krishnamurti ji said and Dr. Geeta Krishnam, uh, Krishnan uh, said, that the with the establishment and the inauguration of the Global Center for Traditional Medicine uh, in Jamnagar in India, where I was very, very privileged and uh, honored to be um, one of the Government of India invitees. Um, and I was able to actually meet Dr. Tanil Janesri, Dr. Geeta and many others here. Once again, we have of course met uh, earlier many times, but um, it was, uh, um, 
it was extremely inspiring and uplifting to see uh, that India has been chosen as the country for the establishment of the very first global center for traditional medicine by the WHO. So I think that uh, is symbolic of where we are. There, there are so many other things that are going on. But the establishment of the GCTM in India, where 2,000 plus international delegates came and um, many, many MOUs between countries and organizations were signed on that auspicious day. I think that to me is extremely symbolic and that happened in April this year as Dr. Geeta Krishnan just mentioned. So um, we are in interesting times and as um, the responsible bearers of the torch of Ayurveda for the world and as uh, integrated doctors who are also here. We have some global representation. Dr. Nina is here from Brazil. We have Dr. Trupti Gokani from US, but she's an integrative uh, medical professional. So with that, I think we are very uh, appropriately set for today's uh, theme, which is Ayurveda for global healthcare. So uh, with that, I would like to introduce our esteemed panel for today. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Harish Varmaji, who is an Ayurveda Charya, physician, teacher, author, successful entrepreneur, and founder of MS Indian Herbal Remedies, Bati, HP India, and of Best Ayurveda Limited, Ontario, Canada. He comes from a family of four generations of Ayurvedic doctors, and he is joining us from Ontario, Canada today. Uh, Dr. Tripti Gokani is an integrative medical doctor with a postdoc. Dr. Sujata, could you please highlight the panelists, please, for everyone? Thank you. Dr. Tripti Gokani is an integrative medical doctor with a postdoc in clinical psychopharmacology. She has a variety of trainings in Ayurveda and energy healing from several different institutes. She joins us from Illinois, USA. And if you could please, Dr. Sujata Reddy, please add the spotlight for uh, as a panel to, to uh, uh, all the speakers, please. Thank you. Mamta Landerman is a clinical Ayurveda and Panchakarma specialist and a freelance teacher practitioner in Ayurveda and Jyotish. She is based out of California, USA. We have Dr. Madan Tangavelu. He is a genome biologist inventor of the molecular copy counting technique, a member of several prestigious local and global organizations, an honorary adjunct professor at the University of TDU, Transdisciplinary uh, Health Sciences and Technology University, Bangalore, and a former trustee of the Research Council for Alternative Medicine UK. He joins us from UK. Dr. Nina Claudia Barboza da Silva, Maybe uh, maybe I can find Dr. Nina to spotlight her. Um, Dr. Sujata, are you here? Yes, I'm here. I did uh, in her. Uh, okay. Um, so, okay. You, yeah, if you can take care of spotlighting Dr. Nina, please. Dr. Nina Claudia Barbosa uh, da Silva has a Master of Biological Sciences and PhD in Plant Biotechnology. She has also done her postdoctoral fellow in ethnobotany and is trained in Ayurveda by the, by the Brazilian Association of Ayurveda and AVP India. She's also a professor researcher at the Faculty of Pharmacy, uh, UFRG, working on medicinal plants, ethnobotany, and Ayurveda. She joins us from Brazil. So if you can excuse me for one minute, I think I'll take care of spotlighting. Don't worry. Uh, don't worry, I'll take I'm it over. No problem, no problem. Um, and <laughs> and uh, uh, yes, so that's Dr. Nina for everyone. And uh, finally, Dr. Uh, uh, not Dr. Sorry, Diane uh, Finlayson. Um, Diane, are you here? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, she's uh, M-A-C-I-A-Y-T, is uh, and a yoga therapist, Ayurvedic practitioner, and narrative health specialist. 
who recently retired from her role as a department chair of yoga therapy and ayurveda at Maryland University of Integrative Health. She joins us from USA as well. So welcome to our esteemed panelists and uh, to a very important topic that we are going to be talking about today. It's a very short event and our primary goal is to raise awareness around Ayurveda amongst everybody, including medical professionals as well as lay people. But to have a little bit of an engaging conversation, uh, let me start by asking all the panelists our first question. Where do you think we are in the process of globalization of Ayurveda today? And if I may request, when you answer the question, please try and bring in a little context of your specific country and or organization so that we can get a little bit of a global perspective on this. So uh, I'm going to request uh, Dr. Harish to start and then Dr. Trupti. <coughs> Mamta, Dr. Madan, Dr. Nina, and then Diane. That's the order. We'll follow. Dr. Harish, please. And thank you, Dr. Pratibhaji. And happy Ayurveda Day to all dignitaries and participants in the webinar. I live in Canada, so I'll be answering the question from Canada's perspective. As on today, Ayurveda practice is not regulated in any province of Canada. However, Ayurvedic medicines are regulated, right? like uh, there is a regulatory authority for medicines and Ayurvedic medicines are covered under natural health products. They are called natural health products in Canada. You can see the website of uh, Health Canada. You can find there are a lot of uh, single herbs and multi herb preparations uh, uh, which, are, which have been approved by Health Canada and they are available in Canadian market. I reached Canada around um, uh, in, in 2015 and uh, since then I am working on how to get Ayurveda practice regulated in Canada. For that we formed an association of like-minded people and we uh, before pandemic we approached the uh, officials of Canadian uh, Ontario Health Ministry and about the regulations, what is the process, then they, they asked us few tedious questions. First question was, they asked us, what is the risk involved in Ayurveda practice? And before them, it was very difficult to answer, but it was the question they said, if there is no risk, there is no point of regulating profession, one. And then they asked about what are the minimum what is the minimum qualification required to practice Ayurveda in Canada? They, they themselves said there are many people who are having 500 cores, who are having 200 cores, who are having uh, 3,500 cores. There is a, there are people who are BMS, there are who are MD, PhD. They said, what is the minimum qualification is required to practice Ayurveda in Canada? That was the second question. And um, then they said, what is the present number of uh, practitioners in Canada? And then they listened to us. And then they finally said, the number is very low for a few people. We can't make a complete or a full-fledged directorate. Then they said, but if there will be a demand from the public, we will definitely form a department. And since then, we are working on creating awareness among Canadian public and we are creating uh, we are creating awareness through various lecture series. We are organizing lectures, virtual lectures on Ayurveda. Today even there was a lecture on Chandra Prabhavati, me and Dr. Madanji, Dr. Asavari, we all were present there. And so that is one part we are also creating awareness through radio programs, television programs, and uh, newspapers. So this is what, what is the present status of uh, Ayurveda in Canada. But I, when I started the process, I studied the Chinese system of medicine, traditional Chinese system of medicine. And I found 
they are well organized they are they are quite smart they are taking advantage of the world traditional medicine and and they are i think uh, we are we are behind far behind them because if you look at even from the commercial angle the projection of uh, traditional medicine business in west is around 96 billion dollars in coming years but uh, india is far far behind it and ayurveda is far far behind it this is all what i want to share with you thank you thank you uh, i think dr tripthi you next Sure. Thank you. Namaste, everybody. Namaste. Thank you so much, Dr. Pateva, for having me. And just to kind of continue the conversation, I'm based in Chicago, Illinois, and I say I can represent the U.S. in the Western um, globalization and where we are with Ayurveda. And just to share a little bit about my background to understand where I'm coming from is I was born in Kampala, Uganda, Indian of origin, born in Kampala, moved to Chicago. We were actually kicked out of the country. So I, I was actually smuggled out of the country and brought to Chicago, Illinois when I was about 1 year of age. And Ayurveda I hadn't discovered Ayurveda until I was a first year medical student. And why this is important is I didn't grow up with the Ayurvedic wisdom as many of you have. And for me, uh I it was actually good because I didn't have any understanding of approaches outside of the western model. My father was a very western primary care physician who practiced western medicine. So when I went to first year medical school and I struggled with my own symptoms, I had severe insomnia. I had tried some natural things on my own, went to see a psychiatrist because I was so desperately looking for the answer. The psychiatrist in 10 minutes asked me about eight questions and then diagnosed me with major depressive disorder and gave me a prescription for an antidepressant. Many of you are aware of Prozac. And I remember it was a 10 minute visit. I had thought I was healthy according to the western definition of health, which is being free of illness or injury and having insomnia in western medicine isn't considered a disease yet. So western doctors will tell you you're healthy. And yet there was a gap. I obviously wasn't healthy. And then as soon as that doctor gave me a prescription, I said something is absolutely missing. Missing in this model of healthcare. and yet i had been grateful to be healthy up until then until that symptom occurred so why i'm telling you the story is at that point i started reading ayurveda textbooks while i was in medical school and i found the answers in the beautiful science of ayurveda and so it was only at that juncture did i realize that we're missing a lot in the western system so this was about 30 years ago thankfully found the answers in ayurveda made a few changes in my lifestyle changed the way i viewed things i was incredibly vata imbalanced as you can imagine as a medical student and what i realized was that if i could stop doing things that were pushing me out of alignment and bring myself into alignment quickly my symptoms went away and it was so clear that this model needed to be shared and yet i was in the western system so where are we now 30 years later first of all i am disease free symptom free off of all medications i never took the prozac but what i can share with all of you is that where we are in the recognition of ayurveda here in the US is that now more than ever I'm finding that Americans are ready the westerners are ready there's actually this momentum of understanding what are we missing in western health why is the cost of healthcare rising 4 trillion dollars was spent in 2020 in healthcare in the US it's now projected to be 6.28 trillion dollars in 2028 and if we were ranked number 1 in the world in the US that would be fantastic but we're not the last ranking was 37th in the world um in terms of healthcare outcomes so bottom line what i know is my colleagues are telling me is teach us how to ap- apply this what was missing in in my early days i think about the energy body i think about the emotional understanding of our emotional body and our physical well-being because ayurveda could very clearly links emotions and physical body as one um medical western medical is very much segmenting out the body and the mind so just in a nutshell what i'll say is that i do believe that now the community is much more ready than they were even 5 years ago and i think after the pandemic mental health crisis is now the number one concern so we have these incredible tools and i do believe that we are now ready to share the tools yet i'll tell you the solutions later that i think would be really helpful um yet i'm grateful to say that i are you that that came to me so many years ago and i've been happy to share it with so many others so thank you for having me Thank you doc- Dr. Tripti we will summarize at the end of the first round um I would like to invite Mamta to share her thoughts 
Namaste, everyone. Happy Ayurveda Day and happy Diwali. Thank you so much, the organizers of Global Ayurveda Day. And namaste to all our special guests, dignitaries, and fellow panelists. This is a very important conversation and we're having today. And what is truly great is the coming together of so many significant movers and shakers in the world of Ayurveda to join hands to explore what is best for the spread of Ayurveda globally. I'm from California, USA, and I'm the president of the California Association of Ayurvedic Medicine, CAM. Um, we were the first professional state organization to form in the U.S. in 1998. At that time, education started out as a 600-hour program. It grew to 1,500 hours, and today it's about 4,600 hours. There are many schools that have followed a similar format since covid and have gone online actually, which has also created its own problems. There are many more state and national organizations and credentialing organizations such as those represented here. So Ayurveda is growing and it's growing in many different ways. One of the challenges is that to offer a higher standard requires more hours of study. Ayurveda is not a licensed profession, so our students to invest in three to five year full time study without any guarantees of a successful pro uh, profession, without getting student loans to pay for the tuition or to live and giving up a career, uh, you know, or jobs or being able to get insurance for patients, all of this comes as a challenge over here where Ayurveda stands. CAM was very instrumental in 2002 uh, because before that, uh, an alternative practitioner could not touch a person. If you touch them, you could be charged with practicing medicine without a license. So CAM went uh, to the legislature, state legislature. We joined hands with other professions like homeopaths, et cetera, and we got the Senate Bill 577 passed. Now the onus is on uh, a doctor or somebody accusing you uh, to prove that what you gave was willful negligence or malintent. And unless you are proven to show that harm was done, you cannot be charged. And this has been very important for the growth of all the alternative professions and especially for Ayurveda, where now there are about 400 to 1,000 students graduating a year just from California alone. Now, India has been the great custodian of this knowledge, which has gone through many stages of evolution there itself. It has been practiced and taught by rishis and great Vedyas. Health was practiced as a way of life. Its qualities list and thought. Experientially, the Guru Shishya Parampara. For centuries, it was so culturally integrated that what the housewife and the grandmother taught their children, the same practices that Vedas professed. The practice of Ayurveda has gone through the invasion of Yunani medicine, Persian medicine, and in the last 400 years, it was repressed by the British. Today, Ayurveda is taught alongside. Western medicine in a Western format, tested in Western ways, which restricts itself to mainly the clinical format. And this is actually great because Ayurveda says, while the laws are universal, we have to adapt to Kal, Desh, Patra. Because the Ayurveda practitioner in India is trained in both Western and Indian science, they help bridge the gap into the modern world. Quantum physics and epigenetics is also helping communicate the soul and consciousness part into the modern, modern mind, which is basically absent in the Western medical paradigm. The people in the US have primarily entered Ayurveda through yoga. They're tired of being labeled. They want to have a say in their health. As it gets more notoriety, it is attracting professionals as well. Patients do not want to just get a clinical assessment and a prescription, which is the Western model. The scope of practice right now here is diet and lifestyle. 
We cannot treat disease or use Western diagnostics. Practitioners use Ayurvedic example uh, diagnostics like Vata or Kapha in the Pranavaha Shrota and appe uh, appease that. It has been a grassroots movement, but imagine how many people benefit from just correcting diet and lifestyle, counseling, coaching, and practitioner levels have helped root Ayurveda here. Now the next steps of legitimizing the Ayurveda doctor with proper qualifications is the next steps. The challenge... Uh, sorry to interrupt. You have 30 seconds. Okay. Thank so, you. What I want to say is we have two kinds of challenges. One is uh, the practitioners from here are underqualified to, to go further and the practitioners from India are overqualified for the scope that is available here. And we need to go to the source of Ayurveda for inspiration, for guidance. We, there needs to be a Samudra Mantan when all sides have to collaborate some brought their strength, some bring their light, others their wisdom. And after the continuous churning, let the elixir of Ayurveda of the future be invoked and propagate. Thank you. Thank you, Bhanta. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights. Uh, Dr. Madan, please. Namaskarji. Um... Thank you so much. I'm going, to, I'm going to take the liberty of sharing five slides, if I may, to, and images will leave a better impression on the people who are listening to what I have. So, um, if you'll permit me, uh, just five slides very quickly to show you where UK and the rest of Europe is. And okay, Madanji, you can go ahead and share. Thank you. There we are. Now, uh, I was listening to Mamtaji talk about the intangibles, you know, the, the, the kind of... Is my screen visible? Apologies. No, it's not. Now it is. Thank you. So this is... This is uh, I'll take you in deep into the first most important development that's happened here. You can see it's a discussion that's going on at the highest governmental level, at the Prime Minister's office level between India and the UK with a view to developing a roadmap for the future. And that is going all the way to 2030. 2030 is that magical figure. Everybody wants all the problems of the world to be solved by 2030. So so let's. So this is where 2030 fits in this whole thing. Number one, for that document is available online uh, at that link below. If you just go 2030 roadmap India UK future, you will get it. The second is uh, it's in five sections. The fifth section is to do with health, and uh, two points I highlight: points 32 and 32 point sub point 32.1. It's about Ayurveda and alternative medicine, and it spells out very clearly, explore cooperation on research into Ayurveda and promote yoga in the UK. So it has gone up to the highest level between India and the UK. The prime ministers and their teams have decided that this is what's going to be. Point 33 is very important, the National Health Service. You know, Unlike America, we have a completely government-funded health service. And our budgets are nothing compared to the American uh, figures that were cited uh, by Tripti. UK spends about 10, about just about 10 to 12 billion pounds a month for its budget. So that's the healthcare budget for about 67 million people. And that is about all of India's health budget for a year. That figure. So what UK spends for six, seven million people every month is what India spends for the whole year for 1,400 million people. And I don't even want to make that comparison with America. But anyway, there's recognition here that uh, all of this will be part of this intergovernmental discussion. And we had, uh, leading up to that, there was a lot of work that was done by the High Commission in London. You can see on the right-hand side, our formidable former High Commissioner, uh, Her Excellency Gayatri Sakumar, 
who was earlier the ambassador of India to the European Union, Belgium uh, and Luxembourg before she came to take on her role in London. And on the left-hand side, Catherine Edwards, the first female woman registrar of the Royal College of Physicians. On the 12th of May, we got together in London at the Royal College of Physicians. A very, very prestigious historic institution. And for those interested, you can see the recordings of all of that. It's about a seven, seven, eight hour recording that's available on the website. So you can see what was discussed there. Now the Royal College of Physicians set up by Henry VIII in 1518 and continues to be a very difficult institution that sets the tone for much of medical practice in there. Now, that one point I want to highlight is the crest of the Royal College of uh, Medicine. It shows a very interesting image. It shows a golden pomegranate on the bottom and up on the top, somebody holding a hand looks like somebody is doing Nadi Pariksha. We, it seems like we are revisiting history. It seems like we are going back 500 years going back to the mood that was there then. And uh, it's happening at the prime ministerial level today. So there are a lot of discussions going on here. Finally, I finish off with this just one slide, which resonates a little bit with the, the theme for Ayurveda Day, the seventh Ayurveda Day, Hargar Hardin Ayurveda. So we've had interactions here between the All India Institute of Medical Science and several teams here in Europe shown here on the right hand side, the European Ayurveda Association, the Medical University of Graz, the French National Institute for Health and Medical Research. And we came together two years ago in Delhi on a India um, European workshop on next generation physiology for healthy lifestyle, physiology for good health and prevention of non-communicable diseases. So this is in about the general area where, you know, India UK relationships are and all the general area and how it resonates with the big principles of Ayurveda, where the rest of Europe and what are the mood, what's the mood in the rest of Europe? You know, if you look at the European Union, uh, the 27 countries, the theme, the, the emphasis on prevention is huge. And Professor they Madanji, I hate to interrupt. 30 there seconds. Are. There we are, you. done. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry. No, 30 no, seconds. You can, you can continue. I Thank hope you. I managed to convey a, a, a little bit of force there in what is happening here in between India UK and between India and the European Union and the mood here. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Madan. Um, Dr. Nina, please. Thank you very much for inviting me for this special moment. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure for me. Uh, be here presenting some aspects from Brazilian uh, Ayurveda uh, scenario. So uh, Ayurveda in Brazil is recognized by the Brazilian Minister of Health as an integrative and complementary practice, being its offer in the public health system in the country, the United Health System, for since, since to 2017. Data from the Ministry of Health itself indicate that the number of individual consultations in Ayurveda in, with Ayurveda in public health uh, facilities are around 800, 814 in 2017, 925 in 28, and 678 uh, as uh, of June uh, 2019. We have not had any data released since then. But for a comparative reference, in the same pe period, individual care with traditional medicine uh, was about uh, 90,000 in 2017, 160,000 in 2018, and 200,000 until June 2019. It's still on the Ayurveda care uh, registered by the Ministry of Health in our public health. There is no information on what type of care they are, what are the therapeutic approaches, and who are the professionals who are offering Ayurveda in our public health system. 
Ayurveda in Brazil is currently concentrated in private care outside the public health system. And as far as it know, there is no data on the number of people seen in private offices and clinics. Speaking for professional, speaking of professional and uh, who practice Ayurveda in Brazil, Altrugo have excellent professional. There is no legal recognition, uh, recognition of the professional, uh, nor the professional is regular, uh, regular, uh, recognized in Brazil. Whether professional practitioner, doctors, therapists, whatever, the level of training and professional acti activity. Since 2016, a bill has been uh, discussed by the Brazilian authority, authorities uh, to regulate the profession, but without concrete results until now. Despite this, in Brazil, there are several courses offered with uh, different hours and content, some at the specialization level, recognized by our Minister of Education, Regarding the minimal uh, hour load, most of these courses range from 300 uh, to 400 hours, with some from 1,000 and 200 to 2,000 hours. The teaching of Ayurveda is not yet implemented in Brazil universities as bachelor degrees course or something like that. Given this scenario, uh, the globalization of Ayurveda in Brazil still goes through fundamental legal and techno technical aspects so that we can offer it uh, widely to Brazilian population. Both civil uh, society organizations and government agents have been working to improve this scenario, but to now this is the, the real scenario in Brazil. That's it. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Nina. Thank you. Uh, Diane? Thank you so much. Uh, I'm honored to be part of the panel. I'm very grateful for the inclusion, and I'm uh, delighted to have the opportunity to be part of Global uh, Ayurveda Health Day. I uh, love this medicine. Uh, even though I'm not a doctor, I understand, I'm a practitioner and I understand the value and the importance of this medicine, especially to public health. I come to this as um, a higher education uh, profession. And I've been working with the Maryland University of Integrative Health, uh, an institution that started as the first acupuncture institute in the U.S. I see Ayurveda currently as being in a similar position to traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture in the 70s and 80s. Uh, there is an opportunity for this medicine to move forward and take hold, but there are barriers in the U.S. to its acceptance some of which have already been spoken of. For instance, it is an unregulated medicine currently. And in states that do not support uh, the Health Freedom Act, which Mamta mentioned, there is the danger of someone who's practicing Ayurvedic medicine without a Western medical license of being accused of practicing medicine without a license. So there are issues that creates for creating programs to teach Ayurvedic medicine in accredited institutions. One of the things um, a regionally accredited university has to think about when they're creating programs for their students is whether or not that student will be able to go out and make a living because if they can't make a living with the degree that they've gotten, then the university is considered to be um, predatory. So there has to be a way to create what I would call um, allied Ayurvedic allied health opportunities so that if uh, 
A university like our university is doing essentially a health coach program. We're not saying anybody's a doctor. We're not saying they can diagnose and treat. They're able to assess and educate based on Ayurvedic principles. Additionally, someone mentioned how many people are coming to Ayurveda through the world of yoga. And we certainly see that as well. And I think it's interesting. I've been involved with the Yoga Therapy Master of Science program at MUIH. And we have been able to integrate yoga into acute care settings and help patients in hospitals uh, connect to and use yoga as a medicine. So I'm confident there are ways that Ayurveda can move forward and be accepted in a similar way with whether it's regulated or unregulated. I am encouraged by uh, Dr. Gita Krishnan uh, Pillai talking about the advances that who uh, the World Health Organization is making. I feel that the ICD project and the other project he was discussing are going to be very instrumental in helping the US uh, integrate Ayurveda into uh, the healthcare system here, because without ICD, without the the terminology, the like terminology, it would be very difficult for Western medicine to understand and incorporate this traditional medicine with integrity into the system. And I think it's very important that whatever way we're using the medicine, we have to remember where it came from and really honor the roots and carry it forward with integrity. We can't, we can't make it, you know, we can't force it into the Western system. It, it is its own system and it deserves its own space to breathe, breathe and live. Yet we have to help people understand the correlations within the systems that we're working in so that it can be understood, appreciated, and used for whole health care. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you to all the panelists for uh, giving your thoughts and perspectives on the first question that was asked. So Dr. Thrupti's second question is still pending, so don't worry. You'll get a chance to talk about it. So just to summarize from round one, I think Dr. Harish um, talked about the uh, local challenges in Canada about the recognition of Ayurveda as a system of medicine, you know, the risks involved and whatnot. And um, just so everybody knows, Dr. Harish Verma is doing a tremendous job in Canada uh, through the local association. and. Uh, they they have found out a very uh, creative way of focusing on the word traditional. So traditional Ayurvedic medicine is something that is uh, formulated a, into their uh, one of their federal guideline documents, and they are, as I, if I understand correctly, they are trying to popularize that more and bring that lingo or that terminology more into the um, into usage and and uh, based on that they will be uh, more uh, effective um, uh, effort to integrate Ayurveda into mainstream. So Harishi, I hope I understood correctly, <laughs> but you will be opening the second, sorry, let me unmute you, but we will be opening the second round um, in a bit. So, uh, so I'll just uh, round this up. Uh, Dr. Tripti, thank you for sharing your personal story and you come uh, to the panel as an integrative medicine practitioner. Uh, so uh, your perspective is, is very helpful to hear from the other side as well. And um, as Dr. Nesri was talking from illness to wellness, uh, you know, we, I think, I think what um, I would like to add to that is why just illness to wellness? Why not wellness to health? 
and if illness then illness to help you know so i think ayurveda brings to the table the whole science of health so we are not a true health care currently so i think we we kind of as a as a community we need to underscore the importance of health and well being health care comes later you know i mean or or let's say health care includes health and well being not just disease care which mostly what it is confined to right now so i think that's that's something really important and mamta brought the you know looking issues from california and what cam has done um i think um one of the important things she mentioned was the health freedom act which is a bit which has been passed in 12 states in united states and that brings in some degree of empowerment for the consumer but still um our rights as consumers are very limited because of all the laws and regulations of the country and the state um and i just want to quickly add what i had learned along the way is that even if you are recommending to your nice neighbor please have a hot chicken soup for this cold that you have and you'll feel better that in some states can be construed as medical advice and a felony so it's not that straightforward um and then uh, dr madan has shared so much rich information we can you know dr madan always has a lot of information great information to share and i have a feeling we will have to do a proper elaborate event very soon where we can have a longer discussions you know again today the focus was uh, to build awareness so uh, we will probably work on that all the collaborative uh, organizations please take note uh, i'll request anybody who is not speaking to be on mute please there is some music coming in um, i think harish ji are you on unmute can you mute please thank you it could be coming from somewhere else i don't know but some music was coming um then uh, dr pratik uh, sorry to interrupt um well, we may need to announce that we may go a little bit over time um uh, we were oh. supposed to finish at 1:30 but i'm sure the discussions and questions are so interesting i'm sure everybody would not mind staying over uh, but we may need some more time to uh, thank to- you the event yeah thank you thank you dr hina uh, and and yes we will probably be going just barely 10 to 15 minutes over because we have just one more round of questions and then we will be concluding uh but dr nina thank you for bringing in the perspective from brazil and you brought in some data so thank you so much data is always helpful because that's giving you concrete numbers not what we are perceiving um and you also mentioned about um i have been not being recognized even in brazil but um education is possible and that's something we all need to um acknowledge and maybe work on that because often education becomes a route through which uh modality can get licensed then last but not the least dian brought in the important perspective from maryland university of integrative health again the word integrative is there and in the more integrated universities we have groups organizations platforms professionals we have the better it is you know the the uh, scene looks better the possibilities look better for a system like ayurveda to be integrated recently i was in a meeting of nccih which is the national center for complementary and integrated health uh, just last week and i was delighted to see that dr helen langwin who is uh, you know from nih she underscored the uh, uh in one of her part points which i took a screenshot um the fourth bullet was rcts are probably overrated so i was delighted to hear that because you know this was a uh meeting on whole systems uh research method methods so i think we should be talking about that but again to just summarize i think we are talking about um, i understand yoga is being integrated reiki is being integrated a lot of alternate methods are being integrated into mainstream care when we come to ayurveda i think the there is additional challenge because we are talking about 
ingesting something the minute we are talking about ingesting something uh, the kind of regulatory bodies that come in is very different you know compared to yoga and also i feel they are like two different uh, uh scenarios you know so uh, ayurveda comes with its own unique uh, challenges and when we talk about challenges for global health care we are talking about uh, in many different sectors we can say we are talking about uh, the awareness the education uh, the integration but also we are talking about regulatory uh, handicaps you know limitations and that we should not forget because fda um, and um, the, the pharmaceutical lobby etc they are not interested in listening to what value or history or tradition they they look with different lenses so we know that's different you know set of challenges so very very complex but you know i'm so glad that we are in this amazing conversation today so that's that's the takeaway but to come to our second question for the panel and then we will be concluding is what are the three things and if you could answer in brief that you suggest that can facilitate the integration of ayurveda into mainstream healthcare and we'll again start with dr harish ji thank you dr pratibha ji when i was a student of bams final year i wrote a book this is the book i think it is visible so this book is based on modern diagnosis and ayurvedic treatment and since 1985 i am practicing this principle up to modern up to diagnosis we take we should take advantage of modern science modern technologies modern terms modern laboratory investigations mri ct scan everything everything modern but as far as treatment of that particular disease is concerned we should apply ayurvedic principles principles of uh, vata pitta kapha and, and i am practicing it and we are very successful i have successfully treated more than 25000 patients of ulcerative colitis in delhi before coming to canada so we have rec- record so this is the one point i want to mention at, uh, on this platform that for integration we can integrate both the sciences up to modern up to diagnosis we can take advantage of modern science and technologies and for treatment we can apply uh, principles of ayurveda for uh, Uh, medicines for therapies for diet and for lifestyle regulations this is one second for research for research i would like to request all the ayurvedic practitioners that we should do research on ayurvedic traditional ayurvedic medicines as a whole not on a single molecule or a active molecule this is not our job this is the job of the pharmacologists to find out what is the active molecule because prativaji in your seminar one person asked this question can we call curcumin ayurvedic now look at if we move from haridrakhand to if we narrow down the research from haridrakhand to active molecule haridra then then further narrowing down to uh, curcumin and and result is we we can say we have found curcumin but that will that will not remain ayurvedic it will go into pharma side and then finally we will not be allowed to use it this is what is happening this is what what has happened with colchicin we are not allowed to use colchicin in ayurveda we can use suranja we can use colchicum luteum similarly reserpine we can uh, similarly digoxin we are not allowed to use it then what is the point of doing research on single molecules we should do research on traditional ayurvedic medicines as such we should do research on <coughs> arjuna rest kumari asa we can see we can uh, with the new uh, methods of uh, research we can find out how effective it is how safe our medicines are today we have a very good session on chandra prabhavati in modern medicine there is no preventive medicine 
uh, to prevent to prevent the onset of diabetes for pre-diabetic patients. And Chandrapava Vati is a fantastic medicine, but we need to position it. So this is the one uh, suggestion for researchers. And third is uh, third suggestion for the education. As I mentioned earlier, regulators are asking us what is what should be the minimum qualification for the Ayurvedic practitioners. Now WHO curricular this WHO document which is available on the net a benchmark for a training to Ayurvedic practitioner uh, that says 33,500 uh, 3, hours. On other side, RAV has also mandated for uh, uh, for the education regulation outside India from Indian government. So they are recommending 800 hours a course for practitioners of uh, Ayurveda. So to whom we should listen? Now. I think we we all should brainstorm and we, we should find out what should be the scope of Ayurveda practitioner. We can uh, we can learn from how that diploma of Ayurveda was started in India of homeopathy. They started from diploma in homeopathy, then they reached to degree of homeopathy, B, BHMS, then they reached to MD. Now they are also thinking of PhD in Homeopathy. Similarly, we can also design a short course uh, of diploma in Ayurveda in West, then the uh, degree, then the post-graduation, then the uh, uh, doctorate or the uh, PhD program in Ayurveda. This is all about what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harishji. Very important points. Uh, Dr. Trupti. Yeah, so you're not easy to answer this, right? Because there's so many, so many factors that are involved in really moving things forward. But I'll say the three big things, speaking from the Western practitioner who is who's done my best over the last 20 years of running a practice to bring Ayurveda into my center. Number one concern is billing, is paying for the services. And how do we get insurance companies to even cover? Starts with the conversations that have already been had. Dr. Gita mentioned. Um, kind of coming up with the classification, coming up with codes, coming up with some understanding of what the diagnoses are. I went back to my early story to share with you that, that Prozac and the diagnosis of depression didn't match what was really going on. It was a vata imbalance. So the diagnosis Ayurvedically is looking at it from that perspective. It's a different conversation than the Western conversation. Somehow we have to bridge the conversations. So at least here in the U.S., if we're going to talk about sleep issues, if someone comes into the doctor with sleep issues or speaks to the Ayurvedic practitioner for sleep issues, is there a way to get coverage for that? And if so, how can we unify the message? So number one, we're having individuals come in earlier, not waiting until the symptom becomes the disease and then gets coverage for it. And if there's somehow a way to incorporate the billing system here in the United States, it's really important for patients. They'll ask, can I bill this to my insurance company? Because we don't have the universal system of healthcare here. So we, we have patients that are going to ask that question. Unfortunately, we don't have a way to get their, co their services covered. So when it comes to a month that which you brought up about, you know, the training, which is so incredibly important to have the students become trained and equally trained. I love how you said the overqualified in, the, in, in India, but somewhat, you know, underqualified or qualified in different levels here in the U.S. Absolutely. We don't even have the qualification of the practitioners here. So number one, if we had coverage, that would be wonderful. Number two, if we had practitioners that were equally qualified in the U.S. and had a system of understanding what was going to be expected with that first visit. And maybe even simplifying the message, because I know the Western practitioners, you know, they, they finish their visit in about 10 minutes. Ayurvedic, we know an Ayurvedic conversation can last 90 minutes longer, even depending on the time that we spend. So how do we bridge the gap? I think, number one, if we have coverage, that would be wonderful. Second thing is unifying the practitioners. And I love, you know, what Cam is doing and what Nama is doing to do that. And then thirdly is to somehow create a message that's more simplified. Because the truth of the matter is most patients that come in from the Western or clients that come in from the Western thinking, we all know this, they want quick fix, quick explanation. Tell me exactly what's going on. You know, and yet when you say that, okay, I, I don't have an answer because it's not quite a disease state, or I'm gonna give you like for me a diagnosis of depression. No, no, I'm not depressed. So we have to bridge that gap somehow. 
So I think the beautiful thing, the data that's coming out is like Parkinson's disease, being I'm a neurologist. So Parkinson's disease, very clearly they say, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease begin 20 years before the first Parkinson's symptom as constipation. And yet what are most Western doctors doing? Giving something like Miralax, a laxative for constipation. They're not even understanding that's an imbalanced state. Let's treat that with these Ayurvedic beautiful tools that we have. And so, you know, and also what, um, I think it was Dr. Verma that said this, or was it, I'm sorry, but I'm confusing who said this, but someone said something about like making sure that we push the momentum, right? Dr. Verma, I think you said this, you know, get, get the momentum for the patients to ask before we get the coverage to happen. And I do think what I've been doing is spending a lot of time trying to convince the audience out there, the patients and my Western doctor colleagues. I said, forget about the studies. This is ancient medicine. Who cares about the studies? <laughs> now I'm realizing, okay, maybe we do need more research to convince these guys and to get the billing to occur and to get coverage. So in a nutshell, I think it's getting coverage for the services, um, having practitioners be equal, and then really simplifying the message. I think if we were able to come together and do that and collaborate together to do that, this is a powerful science and we could really move it forward. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tripti. That's very helpful. Um, uh, doctor, sorry, uh, Mamta, sorry, it's your turn. Yeah, hi. Um, I I want to uh, just underline what both Tripti and Varmaji have said, and so I will not repeat those. One of the, the solutions that I see in America is that because there are different levels, if we take that as that is actually important, different levels, I would like to suggest that we think of an Ayurvedic into uh, integrative practice where there is an Ayurveda doctor who has all the qualifications that they need, but they have with them a coach, a counselor that can take care of the mind levels and that they have practitioners that can talk about diet and lifestyle so that the Ayurvedic doctor can do the clinical practice. And I think if these three levels happen, we are addressing body, mind, and soul, all three levels, which is not being done today, or it's left to a single clinical practitioner to do that. And they just don't have the time. And these uh, counselors are really excellent in how they have brought in diet and lifestyle. And I think people can learn from those as well. Maybe it's not an accident that that's how Ayurveda started and that that could go out into the world globally as well as in India. In India, people are, you know, they're going to sleep at 12 o'clock. They're all on their phones. They're listening to their TV serials as they are everywhere in the world today. The world has changed and there is a scope of practice for all these levels. The other thing I want to say is that we need to give quality herbs. Indian herbs are amazing. It is the gift of nature. We have tremendous information, but I have clients that say, I don't want to take the herbs if they were grown and bottled in India because they have heavy metals in them. I know that the government has regulations. I know there are third party testing, but maybe if there was something like in California, you have an organic symbol, a Prop 67 type of a, a stamp that goes on the herbs so that when these are tested and there is a big drive to educate universally, globally, that look for these because what is happening is you have wholesalers and others buying the medicines in India and then selling them over the website, which is very difficult to control. So if there are heavy fines, heavy policing done on that, anything that does not have the stamp or if you use the stamp wrongly, we have to discourage that because they will make an example of one wrong case and all of Ayurveda will get a bad reputation for it. I do think that for education, there needs to be a collaboration between India and America so that, um, that you have trained, experienced clinicians that come here and work with the universities and the colleges. And at the same time, also learn, the people over there learn about the scope of practice, the cultural differences, and the counseling levels that have grown uh, very well 
over here. And lastly, I would say that what is missing is there needs to be some kind of endowment or something set up to educate and for people to be able to afford the uh, Ayurveda education that is needed for Ayurveda to come in its whole scope of practice. So those are my three that I would say at this point. There are others, but I'll give it over to someone else. Thank you, Mamta. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Madan? Now, I come from the world of research, uh, genome biologists. That's the far end of um, much of modern biology research. And when I interact with clinicians and when I interact with policymakers, research turns out to be the worst of those four letter words. They hate research. And without, and every meeting I say, without research, you don't have legs to stand on. You cannot build an argument. So I have three points to offer. Number one, research. Number two, research. And number three, research. And the first one, if you push me, I would say, better clinical research. And it's all that talk about RCT, it is not good for Ayurveda. That is not what Ayurveda is all about. Ayurveda has its own logic. There is a way to do research at the clinical research level. And on a daily basis in India, if you look across the country, you would see many thousands of panchakarma treatments that are going on. But we have no way to harvest that clinical research. For a teaching, India has, I don't know, 400 Ayurveda colleges. You do not get permission to start a college if you don't have a 50 or 100 bed hospital. There's so much work going on in each of these places, clinical, excellent clinical outcomes that are had on a daily basis. We need to harvest that data. Number two, basic research. So where do we go to do basic research? And uh, if you will permit me, just a few slide shares, because this is hot off the press. This is happenings from yesterday at the Indian Embassy in Berlin. Uh, if you look here, this is at the department, one of the clinics in, uh, neurology clinics in Hartingen which is very near the University of Bochum. And it's, uh, uh, we, a previous speaker mentioned about Parkinson's disease. This is a hospital that has enabled the integration of contemporary Western medicine with Ayurveda. And you can see some of the details in this slide here. This was offered yesterday by Sandra, who was heading the Department of Neurology in the university there and uh, doing the clinical work. So I'll share those slides, Tripti, just because you mentioned uh, Parkinson's disease. And I have several other, if you put your phone number there, I can share you all the images and it'll be useful to interact with these clinicians. The data that's coming out on integrative work between contemporary Western medicine and Ayurvedic interventions, understanding Basti, understanding the microbiome, understanding the gut-brain axis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all going on. It's happening as we speak. There are collaborations between Germany and CCRAS. We are not aware of, but all of that is going on. It's useful to know that. The third one is a little uh, at this interface between uh, clinical basic research and fundamental research. And once again, uh, with your permission, a few slides just to show where things are and what is the kind of thinking we want to do. And I want to use one example of NASIA. NASIA is the, is the procedure that is used again here in, um, uh, in Huttingen in Germany. Now, here is a lovely example of work that is suggesting how we may have early indicators of certain neurodegenerative diseases, in this instance, Alzheimer's disease. And the pathway is shown here. And the fascinating actor in all this is the microbiome. And 
The work that's going on in Toronto at the University Health Networks, I thought Harish Ji would present this at the Kite Institute, is worth following. They have already in a collaborative partnership between India and uh, the Canada, and the Kite Institute has associated with it this organization called the Kremlin Brain Institute. Now, I just want to take that information that comes from Australia, connect it with what is happening right now with India, Canada, in terms of research collaboration, all ready to go. And this study that comes from the University of Perugia and connected with COVID-19 and the microbiome paper that's available online, you will see how the investigators have looked at the difference in the microbiome in in the nose and the differences that we see between uh, people who have severe COVID to not. For those interested to dig a little deeper, there is the biochemistry here. We talk about serotonin, but we don't quite connect, which should become kind of intuitive for those in Ayurveda and the clinicians and the modern biologists about the simple tryptophan pathway, how from tryptophan you get conversion to serotonin, how you go down another pathway that leads to pro-inflammatory chemicals. You disturb the microbiome in your nose, you run into problems. And that Professor is- Professor Madanji, whole, sorry that, to interrupt again. <laughs> that is, that's the whole process that is played out again when we talk about inflammation anywhere in the body, whether it's hypertension or process leading to hypertension, processes lead to inflammation of the heart that leads to early stages of all kinds of problems. So once again, leave it there. We will <laughs> hope we can come together to discuss this at length at some point. Certainly, certainly, Madanji. We need I can to see at least one per- I can see at least one person nodding their head. Thanks, Tripti. <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. Yes. Uh, Dr. Nina, thank you so much, Dr. Madanji. Dr. Nina, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Madam. I come from the research uh, uh, universe, and I think and I work, and my mind works as a researcher. So, uh, as I'm an ethnobotany researcher, I always con- think in Ayurveda as a traditional medicine. So, considering Ayurveda as a traditional medicine and that all traditional knowledge runs the risk uh, of being my- misunderstood and mis- misinterpreted when transferred to another cultural system uh, f- from East to the West, it's necessary to harmonize uh, the fundamental concepts of Ayurveda so that uh, there is a correct understanding and application of Ayurveda without misinterpretation, without misunderstanding. That uh, was Dr. Gitan uh, said who is working on it, and it's a very great new. Uh, and not the, the concept, but uh, working in the uh, to turn possible, to make possible Ayurveda for every culture, respecting the local culture also. Uh, second point I think about is about the teaching system. I believe uh, we have to have uh, an Ayurveda teaching system uh, that establish a minimum program, a minimum hours with uh, multi institutional collaboration with the participation of Indian experts and professors respecting the concept of local Ayurveda apl- applied for the particular uh specific uh specificities for uh, local populations and finally uh i believe we have to establish a global network of researchers who can carry out research basic and applied clinical uh, research uh in the collaborative way seeking appropriate methodolo- methodologies for the study of ayurveda uh, we have to study Ayurveda as a home system of medicine, not for uh, a system of medicine that you have just took a pill and it will be fine. Ayurveda is not that. Ayurveda is uh, a traditional medicine and uh, a home system of medicine that consider the human being in the mind, by, uh, mind, body and spirit integration. Uh, we have to find appropriate methodology to study this uh, uh, type of system. That's it. 
Thank you, Dr. Nina. Thank you so much. Diane? Thank you. Thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, as we've been, as I've been listening to the discussion, one of the things that comes up for me is I do really like the idea of an integrative Ayurveda center because the things that in when we look at Ayurvedic medicine and Western medicine, uh, the various components of Ayurveda have different scopes of practices in Western medicine. There's, you know, a registered dietitian or a nutritionist. There's the herbalist or pharmacologist. There's the mental health specialist. There's the physical medicine specialist. So there needs to be a system of uh, clinical Ayurvedic medicine that allows for those scopes of practices. And then that may be a way to, uh, you know, help us work toward, as uh, Dr. Trupti said, how do we get people's care covered? Because patients, clients, whatever, they want their care covered. And many, if we're going to be equitable in the West with this medicine, we have to find a way for our sad insurance companies to really be able to care for people and cover their care, the care they want to have. Uh, so many people who've come to me have been through the Western medical system without good outcomes and they don't know what to do or where to go. So, uh, uh, you know, there needs to be an opportunity and a way for them to get the whole person care they understand and intuitively know that they need. So some kind of insurance better education system. And I do agree that the research that people have been discussing is going to be instrumental in providing the basis that will allow for the integration into the Western medical system without the research to support the, the medicine. It won't be integrated because people will continue to look at it as something other and if we want it understood, we need the data to prove it to the Western system. Thanks. Thank you, Diane. And thank you everyone for patiently staying for this a little overrunning program. Um, but um, I think this is a very good observation for all of us that we need uh, probably a bigger discussion on, on this topic. So I'm, I'm sure everybody on the panel and in the audience will agree. And I would actually, uh, you know, invite my fellow collaborating organizations that we should get together and maybe do a larger event, you know, where it was focused on this topic. Today was a different focus, but just to wrap up everything in, in round two, uh, and then we will go on to the uh, thank you note. Um, so just just to, and if anybody is ah. unmuted, please mute yourself, if you don't mind. Um, I think um, this is why we need ongoing discussions because um, we will no. have... Can you mute yourself, please? This is Dr. Vedya Ji. I think Ashok Vedya Ji. I think you are mute, unmuted. Sorry. Um, so just to um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, highlight uh, that we may have within the same fraternity with common goals, we may have some difference of opinion, like Dr. Harish ji said, maybe use uh, modern uh, diagnostic methods. And then immediately we had we had Dr. Trupti talking about Vata uh, versus her, you know, diagnosis as major depressive disorder, right? So I think uh, in the diagnostics, actually we have a lot of limitations in the Western medicine. But if we are talking about the lab testing, etc., that's additional information. So you know, I think this is a very good opportunity to uh, underscore how. Uh, within the same fraternity with the common goals. We can have a little difference of opinion and we can always with discussion come on a you know good sort of consensus approach. Uh, uh, and then uh, we talked about minimum qualifications and that's an ongoing issue. So we have different categories of challenges, uh, regulatory challenges. Now I just want to um, 
speak about research which uh, madan ji's three points for research and there was a lot of other points you know by other panelists who talked about research within research i think everybody will agree that we have still not defined what does research mean for ayurveda so we are so far away from even getting that data because we cannot get that that data that we are all are looking for that evidence based without really defining what would research mean for a system like ayurveda so so we have a lot of work to do we have a lot of homework for us um you know carved out for us as a fraternity but i think um, we have a lot of takeaways from today's panel discussion we have a lot of suggestions for ayush ministry as well i don't know if dr tanuja is still here but we will be writing up a report at least at gcar we have always been writing reports and getting it published with jame etc uh where we we have some lovely note takers from our organization today and uh, we will be sending some suggestion points to ayush for example to have a global um, conformity as this dr harish varma ji highlighted you know because eta which has been formulated by ayush probably has a different outline which is not in synchrony with who standards so we cannot afford that so uh, and then uh very quickly mamta you also said like you know we need to integrate our practitioner level and health counselors but again there are so many complex issues because right now there is a national body that is certifying all the ayurveda schools and the be focus is completely tangential you know it's like you do a course and you get into practice i have fought for scope of practice within the schools that i am a senior faculty in so it's it's a challenge on many many levels we have to confirm first to that that ac health counselors should be health counselors but are they practicing as health counselors is the million dollar question so we have many in house issues and then we have the out of the house issues so i think we need a uh, probably another event for this unfortunately due to time constraints we will not be able to take questions uh, dr vivek is that okay can we uh, okay thank you um i just would like to invite dr koshik um to give the vote of thanks but before that our very very senior uh ayurveda welfisher global expert and what now dr ashok vaidya ji is here so ashok vaidya ji just one small blessing from you and a couple of words please and then yeah. we go on i have three comments one is that krishno hi loko buddhimata machary shatrushcha buddhimata so i go with the opinion given by dan that primarily we have to think of integrative ayurved and ayurved is not an ancient traditional system ayurved has kept on adding the elements continuously and the diagnostic is are already there and now we are pushing for imaging and other technologies in all ayurvedic hospitals so we need to integrate the ayurved as an approach second point parkinson's disease we did the work for mucuna pruriens in parkinson's disease many years back and i had to present it to lord walton committee of the british parliament and they were very, very much impressed so what dying is saying is right that the evidence has to be three level experiential evidence exploratory evidence and modern science based evidence so it is an integrated pathway of reverse pharmacology and i would like that one day we have a meeting on reverse pharmacology because now it is being taken up by all nations several nations who have traditional medicine this is my comment and i enjoyed all the presentations thank you thank you Ashok Vaidya ji, always a big blessing to see you. Um, and now I would, and, and you know, I definitely want to thank 
all the panelists who have contributed wonderful insights. As I think you will all agree, um, time is never enough. We have so much to talk about. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's really energizing to be able to um, communicate with our fellow um, Ayurveda seekers, believers, enthusiasts, practitioners, professionals across the world. It's always energizing. So when we get together more often, I'm sure we will be able to find some uh, a good roadmap for Ayurveda for global healthcare. So with, with these positive thoughts, I thank you all, uh, my fellow panelists. Thank you so much for taking the time out. And uh, for a formal vote of thanks, I would like to invite Dr. Somesh Kaushik to please uh, conclude the meeting with a formal vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Pratibhaji. Uh, actually, thanking is not enough for all this knowledge bank we had today. I wish we could continue whole day. It's just a, some, such a uh, bank of information. Um, so, uh, so much to learn, so much to do in the future. But again, thank you. So, uh, formally, uh, thank you everyone for coming together and celebrating this uh, uh, International Live at the Day 2022 with us. Uh, and uh, also supporting us and guiding us in our journey of uh, providing and preparing for the Ayurveda for Global Healthcare. Uh, on behalf of American Association of Ayurvedic uh, Professionals, Global Council of Ayurveda Research, National Certification and Counseling, uh, Certification and, Cert and Credentialing Board of Ayurvedic Medicine, uh, I would like to thank our special guests, Dr. Rajesh Kotejaji, uh, Dr. Geeta Krishnanji, Dr. Tanuja Nesari, uh, Mr. Vipul Dave, Dr. Shivendu Sain, Congressman Raja Krishna Murtiji, Dr. Ravi Kohli, and uh, Mr. Bobby Kumar Kotejaji, and also Akalotiji, I guess, excuse me. Our uh, esteemed panelists, uh, we got a lot of information from Professor uh, Madan uh, Tangavaluji. So great uh, to hear from you again. Vedya Harish Verma, Dr. Tripti Gokhani, uh, Diane uh, Finalisan, the Dr. Nina Silva and Mamta Lenderman, um, our media partners, uh, Excellence in Journalism, the South Asian Times, uh, Radio Zindagi, our uh, ever truthful, the Indian uh, Panorama. Again, these are the media partners. I went chair again, uh, Pratibhaji and Rene Mera have done such a wonderful job of putting everything together. So again, thank you, uh, Dr. Shah as an event chair and uh, Dr. Rene Mera for the event coordinator. Our organizing committee, which had done a good job, Dr. Vivek Shanbag, Dr. Mahadevan Sitaraman, uh, Vedya Hina Bhatt, uh, Vedya Maniak Minakshi Gupta, Vedya Sujata Reddy, uh, Vedya Vandana Burnwal, and Vedya Ritika Shah. Our volunteers who have helped us tremendously all the volunteers who have helped us in various capacities, including Dr. Rajesh Kamar, who handled the chat for us, Dr. Hina Bhatt for being our timekeeper, and she did a good job in that. She tried our, her best. Dr. Preeti Bosle for helping us with flyers, Dr. Sujata Reddy for managing uh, Zoom for today's event, and uh, Dr. Abhilesh, uh, Abhishek Lula for who take care of the, uh, the playing all the uh, videos in between and uh, all of us who actually joined us in the journey uh, for learning. We always need your support uh, and we need influencers, we need politicians. Reason being, timing is now. With the establishment of the uh, Global Center for our Traditional Medicine in India, uh, we need to proceed, we need to lead the world. Also, we are looking for the global family. Uh, what's with Kutumbukam is always, we, slow, we use the slogan, and also with that her din her uh, Ayurveda everywhere. So with that one, we need everyone. In, in you, we need your sport, we need a blessing, and we need to also do research, Dr. Madhani said, research, research, research. So basically a lot of research needs to be done. As a part of the these three organizations, AAP, GCAR, NCCBM, we have done our Bhagadari, and we need Bhagadari from all of you. And thank you with that. And we'll be looking forward to meeting you again 
and we need your blessings, we need your support, and we need everything you can, we can, all can do together as a Bhagidar to have Ayurveda licensed in the US. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And uh, please stay tuned to our uh, future events. Uh, I think this uh, has uh, given us, uh, you know, more tasks to get together again and put together a larger discussion, which is focused on some of these complex issues. Uh, with that, thank you again, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>